No harm, no harm. Well, <clears throat> I wish I knew what our brethren and sister preached on Sunday, because I've still got Easter on my mind. I've still got a resurrected Christ on my mind. And uh, I just want to ask you a question. Have you seen Jesus lately? I mean, you know what he looks like. He's that poor guy. Everything he's got was borrowed or given to him. Just kind of a poverty-stricken guy. I mean, you remember him, don't you? His mom and dad were kind of peasant people. They, they weren't wealthy people. They weren't rich people. They weren't highly educated or cultured people. They were just poor, ordinary people. And you remember that, you know, the foxes have holes and the birds of the nest have air, but the sun... Wait a minute. I didn't say that right, did I? The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests. They don't have air. I guess they have air too. But they don't build their nest on air. They build it in a tree somewhere. But Jesus said, the Son of Man hath not place to lay his head. Jesus was one of those fellows that was just so unworldly. He didn't really rise to any fame or fortune other than the fact that he accomplished what he was sent here to do. And we all realize that today, but we realize that the Bible says that when God created a body for Jesus, he did not give him a body or a form that when you would look at him, it would be something that would automatically inspire you to be drawn toward him. Now, God could have. In the DNA of Jesus, God could have put something there that, I mean, was absolutely, you know, he would have been a man of men. He could have been a, had a physique, you know, and he could have, he could have had such wonderful facial uh, features and, and bodily features as to just be, you know, just totally awesome in his appearance, but the Bible says he wasn't like that. There wasn't anything about him that was spectacular that would draw you to him in his physical appearance. He looked like an ordinary man. And, uh, you know, the, the Bible tells us that, you know, he was humiliated. Some of the humiliation he brought on himself. He became and took on himself the form of a servant. Remember how he washed his disciples' feet? That's pretty lowly, isn't it? That's pretty humble. Then, of course, they humiliated him time and again. They mocked him. They ridiculed him. They beat him. They stoned, tried to stone him once. Jesus suffered many, many things. And he was kind of meek and lowly. He didn't have a lot to say about it. He didn't have a lot of rebuke at that time. And so we've got this picture of Jesus as a very meek, humble, loving, absolutely, and you know, I wouldn't do anything tonight to change that image you have of him. Because that's just exactly who he was then. But if you turn to Revelation chapter 1 with me tonight, I want to show you Jesus now. Chapter 1, verse 12. John's heard a voice. Now he's turning to see who it is that's talking. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. Now that was Jesus' term for himself. Clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet like undefined brass, as if they were burned in a furnace. His voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. His countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Father, we thank you tonight for your word. We thank you for the revelation that Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, is no longer a lowly carpenter. 
He's no longer a meek and humble servant of men, but he is now the exalted King of kings and Lord of lords. Father, help us tonight as we could get a glimpse of who you are. Father, we thank you tonight for your word. We thank you for this service, the songs, the testimonies, the prayer time, and all that's been done. We thank God for it. Now, help in the preaching in the next few moments, and we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, there's many, many things about this passage of Scripture that I could share with you tonight, but I want you to realize that it will be different the next time he comes. I mean, don't get in your mind at all that when Jesus comes back, he's going to be riding on a borrowed donkey. He's not coming back into Jerusalem that way. Friend, the next time he comes, he's riding a white stallion and coming in the clouds of glory and every eye is going to behold him. Everyone is going to see him and the tribes of the earth are going to mourn because of him, my Bible says. They're going to look upon him whom they have pierced, friend. One of these days, Jesus is coming back and it's not exactly the same picture that you see here as you saw in his earthly ministry. Thank God for his earthly ministry. Without the earthly ministry, we wouldn't have anything to preach to you tonight. If Christ had not come, you would have no hope. I would have no hope. There would be no good news, which is what gospel means. There would be nothing for me to declare unto you that would give you any hope to get out of the mess that sin has got us in. We'd just have to say we're all doomed and just that'd be the end of it. What a sad service that'd be, wouldn't it? If all a preacher had to do was get up here and tell you that, friend, you're lost in your sins and when you die, you're going to hell and there's no remedy... What an awful dilemma that would be. But thank God, Jesus Christ came in the flesh, born of a woman, and conceived by the Holy Ghost, and he gave his life that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There's something beyond this grave. There's something beyond this life. You are not just destined to live here for a few years and die. You know, we read in, the, in some of the genealogies, and so-and-so begat children, and he lived so-and-so long, and he died. And then it reads, the next guy, he picks up that guy, and he said, he lived so many years, he begat sons and daughters, and he died. What an awful thing, just to live a life and raise kids and die. But friend, that's not the end of the story for the Christian. I like it when that genealogy turns to a fellow by the name of Enoch. And the fellow by the name of Enoch walked with God for 360 years. And the Bible says Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. Enoch walked with God one day until God says, we're closer to my place than yours. Come on home with me, Enoch. And friend, if you'll walk with God one of these days, he's going to say, come on home. Come on home. And friend, if we don't walk with him, we're walking against him and we're walking the wrong direction and we're going to wind up in the wrong place. But thank God tonight for the earthly ministry and the incarnation is the big word that theologians use to incarnate in the flesh. God became man. The Bible calls him Emmanuel. God with us. There was 33 and a half blessed years when God dwelt among men again and taught and preached and raised the dead and healed the sick and f provided food for the hungry. Thank God for the earthly ministry of Jesus and all that it means to us and everything we've learned about that. I don't want to lose a thing of what I've learned about that, but I don't want to look at him still on earth. I don't want to look at him still in the grave. That tomb is empty. That tomb is empty, friend. They, there's no body there. <laughs> Jesus Christ said, I am he that which was alive. And if you don't believe that, you can turn, and don't turn there right now, but just write down Daniel chapter 10. You'll see that Daniel saw an image of this Christ hundreds of years before John saw this image of Christ. And they match up pretty well what, the way, what Daniel saw and what John saw. And, you, you know, we're going to find out one of these days that he is the same yesterday. He was God in the beginning. He was God when he spoke the worlds into existence. He was the mighty creator that out of his mouth and across his lips, friend, worlds were spoken into existence. Sun, moon, and stars and planets begin their orbits and begin their galaxies by the billions, they say. Who was that? It was Jesus that spoke all that into existence. And this same Jesus 
is coming again. So we see him just a little bit here in his majesty, in his glory. And John said, I turned to see, and he said, I saw him, and there was seven golden candlesticks. That's, that's uh, typology that was in the temple. There was uh, one candlestick, the menorah had one stem, one, one lampstand, and seven candles representing one church and several branches. But I want to tell you now, there's a whole bunch of churches among a whole bunch of people. It's not one race that has the monopoly on anything tonight. Jesus Christ came into the world to save every man, woman, and boy, and girl that will receive him. And so this candlestick is seven candlesticks, the number seven representing perfection. And friend, Jesus Christ is still lighting. The church is the candlestick. It tells you that later on in the chapter. You don't have to be a prophetic scholar to figure it out. It tells you right there in the last part of chapter one that the candlesticks represented the seven churches. And the stars that he had in his hand represent the seven angels or the seven messengers. Most scholars believe it's talking about the pastors of those seven churches. Thank God for that. Where would you rather be than in the right hand of Jesus? Where would you rather be than protected by the Son of God who created the worlds and all that's in them and has power? Friend, I want to tell you, it's an amazing thing tonight to see Jesus high and lifted up. It's an amazing thing. It'll cheer you up a little bit. It'll see something bigger than your problem tonight if you can see this Christ who is exalted. John saw him exalted before him. He's walking among the churches. He has the seven golden candlesticks. He's got the seven stars in his hand. And friend, he is wearing a high priestly robe or he is wearing a kingly robe and maybe a combination of the two. This robe, it doesn't tell us a lot about it, but it is a complete robe. He is completely gar uh, garbed with this complete robe down to the foot. Friend, to represent the, the, probably the high priest office. You know, Jesus became our high priest which uh, in turn made all of us priests and kings unto God. We don't need an earthly priest to intercede for us now. We have a high priest in heaven that's interceding for you and for me. And his door is always open. The, the veil of that temple was rent between the Holy of Holies and the Holy Place, giving access not just to the high priest once a year, but to whosoever will can enter into the Holy Place, enter into the very presence of God through the mediatorial role and the priesthood of Jesus Christ. So his garment speaks of his priestly role and probably also of his kingly role. Now the gold, obviously, is the medal of kings. And his breastplate, his girdle, was not down here around the loins. His girdle was up here around the breast. Speaking of righteousness, purity, holiness, Jesus is girded with a golden girdle around this long flowing robe. Can you imagine seeing him in his glory? His hair is white as snow. That does not depict age as we think about it. We think about old age and decay. We think about getting old age and getting crippled up. Well, he's the ancient of days and he's the same as he ever was. The same right arm that brought salvation. Friend, is the same right arm that can lift you out of the depths of sin and pick you up and cause you to, let, to love him and to know him in a great way. This same Jesus, the ancient of days. You said he, he says he there he had white hair. His hairs were white like wool. And in the scripture, the hoary hair is related to wisdom. Dignity and honor. The Eastern culture honors old age. The Eastern cultures honor their parents. The, the, the oldest male in the family is still the patriarch. He still has the final say. We don't do that in the Western culture, but the Easterners still do in some places. But this picture of him that we're seeing with the white hair does not speak of decay or uh, some kind of uh, infirmity. He's not getting senile. He's not getting weak. He's the same omnipotent God that ever he was. He's just very majestic. It says here that his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. The piercing eyes of Almighty God. Friend, the next time he comes, it's not going to be meek and lowly. He's going to be bringing judgment to light. 
The next time he comes, he's going to be revealing sin in a, might, in a great way. And he's come to conquer and to defeat all his enemies. Jesus is going to be able to see right clear. Those blazing eyes, friend, are going to be something to see. You read over in the last chapters of Revelation, from whose face, from whose face the earth and the sea fled away. I think the fire speaks of an anger and a wrath towards sin. I think he's not looking on in love and kindness now. Friend, when he comes back, he's coming to judge the world. When he comes back, he's coming to pay tribute to his enemies. He's going to reward those that have taken him and, and blasphemed him and ridiculed him and denied him. Friend, there's coming a day when Jesus is coming back and it's not the same picture. It's not the same mood. It's not the same form that he came the first time. He came the first time to seek and to save that which is lost. He's coming the next time to judge the world. And those piercing eyes, those fiery eyes of Almighty God, are going to look right through you and me. And friend, fire either purifies or it destroys. The incorruptible elements, fire purifies. So if there's something of an incorruptible nature within you, God will purify that by his fire. But friend, if there's not that, if, if, if we've built on wood, Hey, stubble, the fire of God will purge that. It'll burn it up. We'll not be able to withstand the fiery gaze of Almighty God. You think about that. His eyes were like flame of fire. His feet were like undefined brass as they were burned in a furnace. Friend, his feet, brass, shoes, walking over his enemies, shining, conquering feet, they were humble feet. They wore a pair of sandals at one time. They walked the dusty shores of Galilee, encouraging men and women to, to love God with all their heart, healing their sick, raising their dead, delivering the demoniacs, and bringing peace and joy to the hearts of those that were bound in sin, setting them free and letting the captives go. This is who he was then. When he comes back now, he's treading out the winepress of the wrath of God. You think about that. Have you seen Jesus lately? Oh, I still see him on the cross. Friend, he's not on the cross. Oh, I still see him buried. He's not buried. Oh, I saw him. Maybe some of those critics, well, we watched him die. Yeah, but there were hundreds upon hundreds of eyewitnesses that saw him live after that. <laughs> friend, the most established fact in history is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It says here that is, well, turn over with me before I go any farther. Turn over to Revelations 19. Let's read this together. Revelations 19, verse 11. Another glimpse of him in his glorified estate. Revelations 19, 11. And I saw heaven opened. And behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. He treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. He hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Friend, he's coming back in a different condition than he left this whole world. He left humble. He left humiliated. He left beaten and bleeding. And they buried a body that was mutilated by the wrath of men. But when he comes back the next time, the roles are going to be different. Jesus is coming to tread out the winepress of the wrath of God. We just need to be aware that Jesus is not looking like he used to look. He's not talking like he used to talk. We've had 2,000 years to get ready. 
We've had 2,000 years to get right with God. Say, I'm not that old. Well, the gospel's been preached. The, the redemption price has been paid. Humanity, the human family, has had opportunity to get right with God. Friend, it's only the righteous judgment of God when he punishes those who refuse him. God is coming again. Jesus is coming back. Lord of Lord, King of Kings down his thigh. A vesture dipped in blood representing his own sacrifice. And I want to tell you something tonight. Jesus is coming. Are you ready? Have you seen him lately? If you're not ready, you won't want to see him. You read over there in the book of Revelation, it says, hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. Hide us from the face of God. I don't want to look into the face of God. I don't want to see those blazing eyes. I don't want to feel the guilt and shame when it pierces my soul and reveals everything unclean in me. Oh, dear friends, it's going to be different the next time he comes. Thank God you can be ready. Thank God it can be under the atoning blood, as we sang. Thank God your sin can be dealt with even tonight. You can be free from your sin and be ready to say, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. My his face and his eyes as flames of fire and his voice as the sound of many waters. You ever hear the roar of the Niagara Falls? All those millions of gallons of water that are spilling over that fall, it makes a roar. I want to tell you, the meek and lowly said smoking flax he wouldn't quench and a bruised reed he wouldn't break. That was then. He's coming back with a roar. He didn't open his mouth. He was as a sheep before his shears is dumb, before Pilate and all that crowd. But I want to tell you, the next time he comes, he's going to have a booming voice. You'll hear it. He's coming back with a shout. Maybe it's him doing the shouting. The voice of an archangel and the trump of God, and it's going to wake the dead. The dead in Christ are going to rise first, the Bible says. And then we which are alive and remain are going to be caught up to meet him in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Comfort ye one another with these words. That's what my Bible says. Friend, you can be ready to go. You need to be ready to go because he's coming back and he's not coming back like he left. I mean, in a sense he is because he, he ascended on a cloud in the sense that he arose, he ascended from the Mount of Olives on a cloud and disappeared into the heavens and the angel said, this same Jesus shall come again like you've seen him go on the clouds. But he's not coming back with a lowly garment. He's not coming back with a, with a, with a countenance, friend, like we had when he, when he was here. He's coming back as the Son of God, who he truly is. He said, and went out of his mouth, verse 16, a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shineth in its radiance. I was headed toward Pittsburgh last week before daylight for a board meeting. And I was driving due east. And the sun came up, there wasn't a cloud in the sky. And when that blazing ball of fire approached over the horizon, friend, I began to reach for the sun visors. I began to reach for the sunglasses. I began to reach for everything I could to dim the brightness of that sun. And that's what John said Jesus' face looked like. You're talking about bright. You're talking about radiant, friend. You're talking about the glory and the majesty of Almighty God. He outshines the sun. Think of it. He outshines the sun. John said his face was shining. And out of his mouth went a two-edged sword. What kind of weapons is he coming? Is he coming back with nukes? He going to destroy his, his uh, enemies with nuclear weapons? He's got a weapon and that's all he needs and it's the word of God. He just speaks the word and it's done. He takes the sword of the spirit which is the word of God and he takes all of his enemies away. And some people make fun of this book but this is the sword of the spirit. This is the word of God and this is what Jesus is going to have in his mouth when he comes back. And if you haven't been living up to it, it's going to cut you. It's going to wound you. He's going to quote scripture to you. And you're going to say, guilty. 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 Wouldn't it be better to read it now and follow its precepts? 
and have him say, enter in my good and faithful servant. My friend, Jesus is coming back. He says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys, hell and of death. Man's most feared enemy for many years has been death. Jesus conquered death. Jesus conquered death. The devil had had the power of death for many, many centuries. Jesus took that key away from him. The devil has been unarmed. The grave has been robbed of its victory. And there's a king that's coming back to set up his throne. There's a savior and a redeemer and a high priest that's coming back to get his church. Fellas, we have something to look up about. We have something to look to God about. This thing may wrap up any day now. Oh, we're long overdue. Some of the great preachers of yesteryears have already gone to heaven and they thought it would happen in their lifetime. You said that's been happening all down through the ages. Everybody thought Jesus would come in their lifetime. Somebody's lifetime he's coming. And it's all right with me if it's mine. All right? Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming back as King of kings and Lord of lords. He's coming back as judge and executioner. He's coming back. Whose side are you on? Where do you stand tonight? Do you love him with all your heart? Do you plan to make heaven your home by walking in all the light that he gives you? Loving him, serving him, praying and talking to him, reading your Bible and, and growing in knowledge and the grace of God and in the things of God. Are you going to let this old world cause you to miss heaven? There's many distractions down here, fellas. The devil has many temptations and many distractions. But I want to tell you, you need to set your face like a flint toward heaven. You need to set your wheel that I'm going to do what God wants me to do. No matter who goes and who doesn't. No matter who likes it and who doesn't. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to be what he wants me to be. And some people won't like that. I wish I could stand and tell you after 38 years, 35 years of full-time ministry that everybody liked it. But everybody hasn't liked it. Everybody hasn't patted me on the back. But I'm still going this way. I'm still going this way. My mother didn't like it when I first got saved. She didn't think we needed to go this way. I'm still going this way. There's been a lot of others that didn't like it. Some of your families won't like it. Some of your children may not like it. But you need to settle it in your heart. I'm going to go through with Jesus. Jesus. Because that's what's going to make the difference for all eternity. You can spend your life down here or waste it or whatever you want to do. It's yours. It's in your hands. But if you could put it in his hands, it will endure throughout all eternity. That's a good trade, friend. You can trade a few years of sin down here and drop it off for an eternity of righteousness and peace and joy and home in heaven. As we stand tonight, have you seen Jesus lately? So if you're expecting the same kind of appearance, if you're expecting the same kind of entry, if you think that he's going to be born of a virgin and come back, you're badly mistaken. He'll never be a babe in a manger again. He is the eternal, eternal God. He is the eternal, immutable, unchangeable God.